This is properties of covalent network solids and metallic solids. So these are images up here of the various types of solids. The covalent network solids are all of these up here. And then our metallic solid, an example, is shown right here. And we'll look at the properties of these various types of solids. First, covalent network solids. In covalent network solids, atoms are linked together by covalent bonds. So they're not held together by London dispersion forces or any of the other IMFs or ionic bonds. It's covalent bonds, and it's a giant three-dimensional array. So examples include carbon, silicon, silicon carbide, or carbon silicon right here, or silicon dioxide, otherwise known as quartz, and this is also glass. So let's take a look at some structures of some covalent network solids. We're going to start with carbon network solids. There are several different types, and we call those allotropes. Allotropes are different structural forms of an element. So let's take a look at our carbon allotropes. The first one we're going to look at is diamond right here. Diamond is very hard because we've got covalent bonds. Each one of these is a covalent bond in three dimensions. So in order to break this solid or melt it, you have to overcome all of these covalent bonds, which are much stronger than intermolecular forces. Graphite is another type of carbon solid. It's very soft and slippery because we have covalent bonds within the sheets, but between the sheets, there are only London dispersion forces attracting these sheets together. And so you can slide between the sheets, but the sheets themselves remain intact. There's two other carbon allotropes that are a little more exotic. The first one is called fullerene, and it actually looks like a soccer ball. And it's a, a ball of carbon atoms. So if you have, have a soccer ball, the pattern is the same as a soccer ball. And then we've got carbon nanotubes. These are very, very long fibers. And it's basically a really elongated buckyball that just keeps going and going and going. The properties of covalent network solids. They have very high melting points and boiling points. And that's because the covalent bonds must be broken. Covalent bonds are much stronger than intermolecular forces. Most covalent network solids are hard because the covalent bonds must be broken in three dimensions. Generally, they're non-conductive because the electrons are trapped between atoms and not free to move. For the covalent network solids, you really need to memorize pure carbon, pure silicon, SiO2, and CSI. So a favorite type of AP question which shows up is which has the higher melting point, SiO2 or CH2Cl2. And what's key here is that you remember what type of bonding it is. Your initial response is going to be, oh, oh I know, I know, it's the CH2Cl2. But this is a molecular compound. And so it is held together by intermolecular forces. SiO2 is a network solid, and so it is held together by covalent bonds. And so your correct answer is going to be the SiO2. Graphite um, has some unusual properties. It can conduct electricity along the individual sheets because the electrons are delocalized over the entire sheet by the pi bonds. So the electrons are just going along with the pi bonds. Every single one of these senders here is sp2 hybridized, so we've got empty pi bonds along the top, or p orbitals. And then remember what's holding the sheets together are London dispersion forces. Silicon is used as a semiconductor, and the way that works is if you have an element with an extra electron, 
It replaces one of the SI atoms in a covalent network. There is a negative charge that can then migrate throughout the entire network. If an element is put in that lacks an electron, then we've got a positive charge that can migrate throughout the entire network. So let's look at this a different way. Here's pure silicon right here. If we replace one of the elements with something that has a negative charge, so this shows phosphorus, which has five electrons, valence electrons, instead of four. So what we have is we have an extra electron right here, which then can basically travel throughout the entire network. Instead, if we come over here to the P type, P very creatively stands for positive, N stands for negative, okay? So if we have a boron nucleus, now we've got three valence electrons. And so we have what we call a, a hole here, okay? So we've got a hole for an electron, and this hole can travel throughout the entire network. Metallic so solids are uh, going to be using metal atoms. They're arranged in a regular nice 3D network. So here's a, a metal. And the metallic solid is held together by electrostatic attraction between the sea of valence electrons, shown by these nice little moving electrons, and the metal cations. These electrons do not belong to any particular atom. You can think of them as loose valence electrons. And so the positive metal nuclei are attracted to all of these electrons in the middle. Alloys are blends of metals. And we can also think of these. These are actually solutions, which we'll talk about more later. But these are solutions where we have one metal dissolved in another. And there's two types that you should know. The first is interstitial alloys, where you put a small solute atom in between the larger atoms. And carbon is a favorite here. What this does is it makes the metal more rigid than it, and stronger than it would be normally. So these are interstitial. They go in the little areas in between. The next type is substitutional. Here you want to have blends of metals with similar radii. So you just substitute the atoms in for each other. So brass is an example where you have an alloy of copper and zinc. These tend to remain ductile and malleable like the beginning metal. Okay, so let's do a little review here of metal properties. Metallic bonds are the attraction of the mobile valence electrons for the metal cations, so that's shown in A. B, they conduct electricity because the electrons are mobile. So if we have new electrons coming in, the original electrons can move out. They conduct heat as the atoms are closely packed and transfer kinetic energy relatively uh, easily. And D, they are malleable because the sea of electrons deforms easily as the metal atoms are moved. So if we start shoving here, then the metals can just move, but they're still surrounded by their sea of electrons. Amorphous solids means solids that don't have the nice regular array. So right here, we would have your typical crystalline solid where we have a nice regular array. And then here we have amorphous. So an example of an amorphous solid would be glass, where uh, silicon dioxide is melted down and then poured into a mold and very quickly cooled. They have very broad melting points compared to crystalline solids, because if we look at these bonds here, they're all different uh, arrangements, so there's different strains on them, so they don't melt at a nice sharp point. And that is the end of the notes for these.